Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olker. And I'm Hugh Pope. Up to now on War and Peace, Hugh and I have been talking to guests. Today, we'd like to talk to each other a little bit. I think that's something we're going to introduce in this podcast is conversations about current events that we carry out uh, between ourselves. We hope you'll find interesting. You'll have to let us know. And this time, we're going to have a look at where is Russia going? We are reading so much in the newspapers about Russia winning this and that from Syria to the Middle East, to hosting African presidents in Sochi, to interventions in Venezuela, and even uh, a new entente with China, perhaps. We've decided to talk to Olya about her speciality, which is Russia and its place in the world. Right. And it is it is an interesting time. I mean, one could make the credible argument that uh, Russia has, if not the most effective, then certainly one of the more effective foreign policies of the countries in the world today. Now, whether that's because Russia's doing something right or everybody else is doing things wrong is a bit of an open question. Well, let's break it down. Let's start with Syria, which is sort of exhibit A in, in, in all this. Tell us, why did uh, Russia move in s- with such force in 2015? What was it looking for? And do you think it got what it wanted? So I think this is, yeah, I think this is a great way of thinking through this and a great example, because Russia went into Syria to bolster Assad, who really was on the verge of collapse and who was an ally on the one hand and on the other, Russia really does not like the idea of American-supported regime change everywhere and want to take a stand against it. Russia also was very much concerned that nobody had a plan for after Assad and assumed that after Assad would come chaos, which would be bad for everybody, including Russia. So it went in to bolster Assad. I think in the back of their minds, uh, what um, they were thinking in the Kremlin was that although they were going in to counter U.S. support of at least some of Assad's opposition, that in the end, uh, what they would do is bolster him enough to cut a deal with the Americans, some sort of power sharing arrangement. And that would, to an extent, reverse what was already a tide of ever worsening relations between Russia and the U.S., and create a space for cooperation and coordination. That's certainly not how it's turned out, right? How it's turned out is... The Economist has shown uh, Putin holding a whole basket of snakes now that he's won most of the country back. Well, it's Assad who's won most of the country back. Russia's just backing him, and I think he's their main snake. Um, And I, I I think that's the interesting thing, right, is if you've got a condominium, if you've got a couple of great powers in there, you have leverage over the folks you're supporting. Right now, Russia is supporting the Turks and the Syrians. It's also, to an extent, supporting the YPG, um, the predominantly Kurdish militia, though largely they've been the losers in all of this. The Americans have backed away from them, and I think the Russians weren't able to get them a really good deal out of this. What they got is – and this is only in part of Syria, mind, right? There's still Idlib to sort. But over in northeast Syria, where where all of this has happened in the last few weeks, the Russians are going to be patrolling with the Turks on the one hand and the Syrians on the other and trying to keep peace between them, where the YPG, the Kurdish-led uh, forces, are pretty much out of the game, right? They've, mm. they've moved back. So Russia a bit ahead, but uh, a bit of a mixed bag. What happens if we broaden it out? I've often heard mm-hmm. it said that for Russia... It's different in the Middle East because for America, ultimately, the Middle East is far away. But for Russia, it's almost on the border. It's part of it's not quite near abroad, but not so far away abroad. In the Middle East more generally, do you think that Putin's recent visits to the Gulf and Saudi Arabia and the more general perceptions of Russia rising are helping Russia? Is it winning there? So I think, look, Russia has become a real power broker. And I think you always have to ask winning compared to what. And the United States is backing out of the Middle East. Donald Trump came in to the presidency, a third president in a row, to say he's going to lessen American commitments abroad. Abroad tends to mean the Middle East first and foremost. Uh, Barack Obama thought that it was a bit of a mess. Donald Trump tells us that it's um, bloody sand, I believe. So 
you do have a U.S. that's less engaged. You have a Russia that's more engaged. I think it's also important that Russia takes a very different approach to the Middle East. The United States picks sides. The United States wants countries to choose sides. Russia says, okay, we agree on these things. We disagree on these other things. We'll work together on the things we agree on. Things we disagree on, let the best country win. We'll see what happens. But you know, supporting your adversaries and giving them guns does not stop me working with you on something else. And Middle Eastern countries, I think, are fairly amenable to this approach because they saw a certain hypocrisy in the U.S. approach. Uh, They didn't always believe the Americans were genuinely good and only aiming for everybody's best. And They're okay with this. I mean, the Israelis, the Iranians, the Saudis are okay with an understanding that, yes, we have fundamentally different interests on A, B, and C, but D, E, and F, we can work together on. We'll sort A, B, and C out later. Right. Oli, you've written recently in The Guardian that uh, Russia's secret was that it's a partner to all but an ally to few. I have to say that this sounds a bit like 10-ball juggling, and uh, now that, that Russia has got so many more balls in the air, it's difficult to see how it'll carry on keeping them all up there. And I'd like to turn this to Turkey, where Russia has fought 25 wars over the last couple of centuries. They were on the opposite sides of the Cold War. And Turkey was, in a way, a bit analogous to Cuba for the United States. Turkey was the host of all kinds of missiles and armaments right. pointed into Russia's soft underbelly. Still uh, sort of is. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, perhaps less, uh, less and less. But certainly after the Cold War, Turkey continued to compete with Russia, not just in the Balkans, but in, in the Caucasus. And, and Central Asia, and uh, not without success, I have to say. And it's also a country that's very focused on maintaining its sovereignty. And yet, at the same time, we're seeing this curiously close relationship developing between President Erdogan of Turkey and President Putin of Russia. Do you think that this relationship is something that uh, Russia can really win big on? So, I mean, you, you followed Turkey for your entire career. And I think one of the things that is interesting here is that the Turks hedge, right? Yes, they're in NATO, and that's great as long as NATO is the most powerful alliance. But if NATO isn't going to be the answer 20 years down the road, the um, Ankara wants to be positioned to be in a good shape anyway. So it's making other friends. And the Russians are one of the other friends. And I think for the Russians, um, three years ago, when the Turks shot down a Russian bomber aircraft, and the Turks and the Russians have been supporting opposing sides in Syria, right? Make no mistake. And the Turks uh, shot down a Russian aircraft. And the Russians responded with sanctions and a lot of anger. It was the Turks who eventually backed down. Now, I think that really demonstrated nicely to the Russians that they were in a position of strength, that the Turks needed them more than Moscow needed Ankara. And they've proceeded along these lines. Now, that doesn't mean they don't ever give the Turks what they want and what they need. The Turks are getting things they want. I think... You know, and so far as the Russia has that leverage, that's what makes it possible for them to bring the Turks and the Syrians to the table. In the long term, we're going to see. I think the Turks are continuing to hedge. I mean, what do you think? I think that Turkey is uh, always taking out insurance policies. And when it sees one insurance policy weakening, in this case, mm-hmm. the, and the United States that disappearing over the horizon, it feels the need to shore up its uh, alliances because it uh, it doesn't ever want to be vulnerable to attack. Its whole national narrative is about a Turkey under siege from all sides, eight difficult borders. And so it will and always within. be... It will always be doing its own juggling act. But another place where Russia seems to be uh, finally coming out of the end of the tunnel seems to be Ukraine in the sense that we've seen recently a prisoner exchange between Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've seen very recently uh, signs of uh, de-escalation on the front lines. Is this somewhere where where Russia's also seeing uh, a gamble paying off? So I think in order for Russia to make peace in Ukraine, it has to declare victory and accept some compromises. Uh, Ukraine also has to declare victory and accept some compromises, and that's generally how you get to peace. But I would say in the Middle East, for instance, in a lot of the world, Russia is, quote-unquote, succeeding in part because it has a lot of different values for victory, right? We talked about um, the fact that in Syria it didn't get what it initially wanted, but it got a pretty good outcome anyway. So that sort of adaptability has been important. In Ukraine, Russia has, on the one hand, 
not always known what it wants, but on the other hand, been very willing to reject possible alternative outcomes, which is the worst possible combination. That's how U.S. foreign policy has worked uh, in recent years a little too much of the time. So the problem with Ukraine is everybody has to agree that they want peace more than they want war. And that's going to be the challenge. I think right now, Vladimir Zelensky is the uh, the new president of Ukraine, does want peace more than he wants war. He is challenged by a domestic audience that is very, very afraid of capitulation. Does Russia want peace in the Donbass more than it wants continuing conflict, I think, is the question we have to ask. If it does want peace, I think there are very good solutions that meet everybody's interests possible. This, of course, is not about Crimea. I think we're going to have to accept that, particularly if there's peace in the Donbass, Crimea becomes something that uh, everyone agrees to disagree on for quite a long time. Yes. Of course, Ukraine was one one of the countries that uh, Crisis Group used to hold up as uh, the one country where we would never have to work because it was so naturally embedded in normal state structures that it would never go to war. Is that what we thought? (laughs) That is certainly what we used to think before 2014. And um, of course, uh, there there was a time in one publication which Crisis Group uh, said that Ukraine was the country it would never have to write about. So I hope that uh, this is uh, Ukraine returning to its normal peaceful self. And uh, certainly I know that the Europe and Central Asia program of Crisis Group has done an enormous amount of work to write about the Ukraine since then. Yeah, no, yes, we encourage you listeners to check out some of our work we have a couple of very good reports uh, on on this conflict. And I think we can all point to past publications where we uh, misjudge the future of conflict. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to Olya Oloka. And Hugh Pope. And- <laughs> We are discussing matters relating to Europe and its neighbourhood and how conflict resolution can best be promoted there. Turning more broadly to the the general questions of Russia in the world, we see one of the features of the last year or two has been the United States backing away from or even tearing up arms treaties uh, and missile treaties and so forth. And you've been following these things very closely. Is this uh, something that is causing a lot of worry in Moscow or not? So I think it's bad for Russia. I think Russia would prefer to have kept the arms control framework as it was for all the accusations of violations and not taking these things seriously. I think for the Russians... They felt this this was about getting back to the table and maybe renegotiating some of the agreements, not getting rid of them entirely. But again, I think this is an area where the Russians will try to hold on to what they've got. But failing that has happened with the INF, uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Eventually, if the U.S. decides it gets out, it gets out. And the Russians can live with it, unless, of course, it leads to a global nu- thermonuclear war. None of us can live with it. But in the near term... There are advantages. There are silver linings. At least it's the Americans who look bad. If anything, right, if the Russians were in violation of INF, at least they weren't the ones who pulled out of the treaty. So, you know, while the Russians would prefer that the arms control frameworks remain in place and perhaps even be built on, they'll take what they can get. And uh, if what they can get is looking like the good guys, they'll take that. Obviously, this is a very Western perspective. But we're also seeing Russia apparently growing closer to China again. Do you think there's anything new in this, uh, that Russia is going to be teaming up with uh, non-Western powers? So this has been a long time coming, the Sino-Russian relationship. And it's been a difficult time coming. Uh, You know, you go back 15, 20 years, you see a lot of distrust in Moscow of Beijing. Now, that distrust may or may not still be there, but it's certainly not publicly stated. I mean, I think everyone is looking, other than Beijing, other than China, everyone is looking at China's rise with a combination of trepidation and hoping not to be left behind. Western countries tend to emphasize the trepidation. Russia tends to emphasize the desire not to be left behind. The narrative you do often hear in Moscow about China that's somewhat negative is that, well, we'll be their little brother. Do we want to be a little brother? Do we want to be the junior partner in this relationship? And here, I think it's important to understand that Russia isn't trying to be the Soviet Union. It's not trying to be one of two superpowers. It's trying to position itself to be in the strongest possible place when the new global order shakes out. And 
pushing back against China seems to be a loser's game for that. So they're going to work with the Chinese. And the statement by Vladimir Putin uh, just a few weeks ago that Russia and China would be cooperating on uh, early warning systems, it really is an important, uh, it's an important statement of moving towards closer alignment. So I think we're going to keep seeing that for a while. You mentioned the little brother factor. I mean, talking about Russia on the global stage, yes, there's 145 million people living there, but uh, the economy of $1.7 trillion or so puts it about halfway between Spain and Italy. How can a country like that really compete and be seen to be a winner? Well, I think comparing GDPs and per capita GDPs and so forth isn't always the best way to judge a country's power. Sometimes you can be very economically strong and very large and still not have a very effective foreign policy. The usual line about Russia is that it punches above its weight, and it certainly does. And I think you have to accept the punch rather than the weight um, and analyze the punch rather than the weight. Russia is doing what it's doing. It is sorting through its resources to accomplish the things it's accomplishing. Will that create challenges over time? Of course it will. Everything anyone does is going to have uh, follow-on effects. But spending a lot of time talking about declining Russia when arguably Russia hasn't been declining for a couple of decades now, I think is a mistake. How does this play out in other continents which are traditionally quite far from Russia, like Africa or or, or Latin America? Mm-hmm. Is it, I mean, are we seeing a greater Russia ro- Russian role there? We're certainly seeing a bit more activity. I think um, there are a couple of dynamics that I would point to in this context. One is everywhere Russia is trying to leverage what's left of Soviet relationships and Soviet networks to try to build influence and relationships today. And that works in some places better than others. And it's doing this to build influence. It's also doing this for economic reasons. It wants to sell weapons. It wants to sell energy resources. It wants to sell anything else that might come up or buy things. It, It wants to up the trade to limit some of its dependence on Europe. The other thing that we're seeing is in places like the Middle East, where the United States is moving out, is becoming less active. Where Russia becomes more active, it looks like it's filling a vacuum left by the United States. In places like Africa, where the United States was never that engaged and never quite figured out its own policies, Russia's just filling a vacuum that was a vacuum. I mean, I think the French have been involved in Africa and in some cases are pulling back. So you can make that argument um, of filling a vacuum left by France. But for the most part, Russia's just going in where there wasn't a lot there. And, you know, Western countries can see that as a threat, but it's a, you know, it's it's a different dynamic. How about Venezuela, for instance, where Russia would not have ever been thought of as having anything to do with business in Latin America? But there were quite a lot of hopes uh, raised by the fact that Putin could receive Maduro and Putin might have levers that no one else had. Is that adding anything to global security? Is Russia playing a positive role at all there? I don't know if it's positive or negative. I think the Russians certainly think they're trying to play a positive role, right? They are, again, the same narrative as with Syria, US-backed regime change. The Russians think that when power changes hands as a result of mass protests, that's a dangerous thing, right? Despite the October Revolution. Uh, yes, they, their their own personal experience with it is not uh, is not one of uh, immediate stability. So I think what you're seeing is that um, the Russians went in to the Venezuela situation, let's call it, and had an impact. They became one of the power brokers. They became one of the parties to talk to. Would Maduro have fallen if they hadn't? I don't know. It's always hard to build that counterfactual. But they certainly have positioned themselves as uh, a country you have to reckon with. And they've always had an interest in Latin America, in part to thumb their nose at the United States, even if the United States is itself paying no attention to Latin America. You know, there's always this Russian, what would you do if we were in your back backyard messing about? And my response as an American has always been, I'm not sure we'd notice. But I think that's part of it. And part of it is actual 
interests in these countries, both economic and security. You've talked a bit about the difference between Russia and the Soviet Union. When seen from an external perspective, do you think that a Russia is a friendlier, cuddlier kind of idea globally than the Soviet Union was? You talked about trepidation mm -hmm. relating to China, but is, do you sense that same trepidation relating to Russia? And is that something that Russia has managed to defuse in the world? That's a great question. Um, I think... Yeah, I don't think other than Russia's immediate neighbors and some European countries uh, that aren't as immediate but still fairly close by, there is very little fear of the Russians, not just in the way of the Chinese. I mean, it's not that people really think the Chinese are about to invade unless you're an island in the South China Sea. It's this concern uh, – I mean, with China, I think it's a somewhat amorphous concern that eventually bad things will happen, uh, political, economic. With Russia, it's not entirely clear. And I think where the Soviet Union had an ideology they were pushing and a political systems they wanted, though they certainly cut you some slack if you were willing to oppose their enemy, just like their enemy, the United States, was willing to cut some slack on democracy as long as you oppose the Soviet Union, uh, everything was dressed up in this ideology. Russia is not dressing anything up in any ideology other than countries have interests, countries pursue those interests. It is perfectly reasonable for countries to pursue those interests. Sometimes those interests align, sometimes they don't. Let's see how it shakes out. So a better brand image, uh, some wins along the way. Is Russia on a roll? Is it on a winning streak? Uh, are we going to see a lot more of Russia? I don't think we're going to see less of Russia. I think the winning narrative may be a problem because you never actually win. The game just continues and you can have a, lot, a string of wins and then everything can start going badly for you. There's an awful lot of players in this particular game. You know, if it's a game, it's a role-playing game, right? Um, except it's just reality. So maybe that metaphor doesn't really work. Uh, but I think Russia is doing very well. I think Russia is doing well globally in part because it is very pragmatic about what doing well means and in part because you are seeing a crisis in foreign policy among countries that used to be much more effective. And I think that's also very important to understand kind of we started with this is Russia doing well because it's great at this or is it doing well comparatively because others aren't. And I think there's a lot of the second going on to take nothing away from the effective diplomacy uh, exercised by the Kremlin and its foreign ministry. You know, they are taking advantage of the um, lack of effectiveness of others. I don't think Russia is going anywhere. I, you know, you hear this narrative that one shouldn't worry about Russia, one should worry about China. Good foreign policy means worrying about everybody. Uh, it's not about writing off one country. And I think that's something Russia understands is that it's not about focusing on one country at a time. And I think for too long, too much of Russian foreign policy was very focused on the United States. And now they're finally shifting away from that and looking for specific interests in different regions and different countries in their own right. And I think that's part of what's making Russian foreign policy healthier than it's been in the past. That's great. Olya, thank you so much for sharing your insights on Russia with us. And uh, maybe I shall sign off this time because mm -hmm. I've been interviewing Olya about <laughs> Russia and its place in the world for the War and Peace podcast. And uh, we are talking about Europe and its neighborhood and everything that affects conflicts in that neighborhood. You can dig deeper into our work at www.crisisgroup.org. And uh, there is also a special page for the Europe program, which is headed by Olga Olika, my host. Thank you very much. Thank you. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.